Welcome back, World Warriors, to part three of our ever-expanding Street Fighter retrospective. So far, we've covered how Street Fighter was born, how the second game helped to create the fighting game genre as we know it, and how after this monumental success, Capcom decided to follow it up with a string of spin-offs. But what about Street Fighter 3? Well, today, we're going to answer that question. We're finally going to delve into Street Fighter 3, a game that would soar to heights unlike anything we had ever seen before. But only after it had crashed and burned into the ground. Yeah, buckle up, folks, because today's episode is going to go to some strange places. Enjoy! In the last episode of our retrospective, we delved into the Street Fighter Alpha and Street Fighter EX games. But I know that some of you have been looking forward to Street Fighter 3 the most. This is the game that you've been waiting on since the start of this retrospective, and you've been asking, where has this episode been? What has taken so long for us to get to Street Fighter 3? Good, because now you know how every fighting game fan in the late 90s felt. Yeah, even though the fighting game genre was still fairly new at this time, it was hitting the ground running. The moment that a fighting game came out, a brand new installment of it was already in the works. Mortal Kombat had new installments coming out left and right. Fatal Fury came out the exact same year as Street Fighter 2, and it was getting brand new yearly installments. Hell, Clay Fighters even got sequels. Clay Fighters got an official sequel before Street Fighter 2 did. Don't get me wrong, we all know there were more than just two Street Fighters. Not even counting the multiple versions of each game, Capcom had put out brand new Street Fighter games. But none of them were called Street Fighter 3, and people needed to see that number. There was something about seeing Street Fighter 3 that let people know this was the thing you've been waiting on. This is the official sequel to that game that you all loved, and fans needed that and Capcom wasn't giving it to them. There's a lot of people making the joke, does Capcom know how to count to three? Which always kind of cracks me up because remember, at this point the internet was rare in most people's homes, meaning this joke of does Capcom know how to count to three didn't spread across the world because it became a meme that everyone just kept posting on Twitter. No, it became a joke because literally everyone across the country kept asking it. People were getting so sick of waiting, they collectively formed a hive mind just so they could all complain about it. And the rumor mill around Street Fighter 3 was churning overtime at this point. During these years of anticipation, almost everyone out there claimed they had the inside scoop on Street Fighter 3 and used that to drum up excitement. It was the early 90s equivalent of clickbait. There were retail stores already signing people up for pre-orders of Street Fighter 3 years before the game was even announced just because they knew people would slap that money down. Electronic Gaming Monthly claimed the game was going to have 3D graphics, which might have been them jumping the gun at news on Street Fighter EX. And all the way back in April of 1993, Die Hard Game Fan Magazine, a magazine I just now learned was apparently a thing, but there were 10,000 game magazines back then, who could possibly keep track of them all? But Die Hard Game Fan Magazine put out an article saying they had the real inside scoop on Street Fighter 3. It was only going to feature two returning characters, meaning 14 brand new fighters. 
Those two returning characters, Ryu and Sagat, and each character now had five special moves instead of three, and they would each have a unique mechanic that every character could do, and the new characters would include Chun-Li's little sister and Bison's mentor, who was called Shadow Lu. I promise you this was not an April Fool's Day joke, I'm just bringing this up to let you know that's how desperate people were for news on Street Fighter 3. People were so hungry for this next installment that if a magazine came up to them with no credentials and no sources and told them that the next game would feature someone named Shadow Lu, we were willing to believe it because we just needed anything at that point. But here's the thing. As bizarre as these theories were, as far out there as some of these speculations had become, nobody could possibly have imagined how weird things were getting behind the scenes at Capcom during this time. The development of Street Fighter 3 is one of the most covered stories in all of fighting games, and that's because the road to its release was full of mind-boggling decisions the likes of which Capcom had never seen. Okay, that's an exaggeration. This is Capcom we're talking about. About 70% of their games are made through crazy decisions that make no sense. Realistically speaking, this might not even be in Capcom's top 5 weirdest development stories. Although, speaking of weird developments, before we really delve into how Street Fighter 3 came to be, I have to address something that many, many, many people have brought up to me about Street Fighter 3, which is this little gem. Yes, by now I'm sure that many of you have probably heard the story that the game based off Street Fighter the movie, not this one, but this one, was originally going to be Street Fighter 3. That Capcom reached out to a small up-and-coming Illinois-based fighting game company, Incredible Technologies, to make the sequel to their biggest hit of all time. Now as I said, many people reached out to me to make sure that I knew about this little fact, and to make sure that I'd cover it. But I'm not going to talk about the development of this game today because we're going to give it and Street Fighter the movie their own episode because the development of both of them is so insane that it needs its own spotlight. But I'm also not going to cover how this game started life as Street Fighter 3 simply because... Well, yeah, it isn't actually true. At least, I don't think it is. You see, all these stories about the making of Street Fighter the movie The Game came from a post that Alan Noon, one of the game's artists, made on the old Shore Yukon forums about 15 years ago. In there, he mentions that when he started working on this game, they were working on Street Fighter 3. However, throughout this forum, he clarifies that even he isn't entirely sure that was supposed to be the case. He says they were confused about what they were actually making because they were playing, as he puts it, an international game of telephone, working through multiple different representatives, all going across different language barriers. And then way later in this thread, around page 8, he mentions that they were working on Street Fighter 3 before they actually landed the deal. And when they landed that deal, Capcom let them know, no, you're not making Street Fighter 3, you're making a game based on the movie. So, yeah, if I had to take a guess, I'd say they jumped the gun on this one. They definitely started working on Street Fighter 3, but I don't think Capcom ever wanted them to make Street Fighter 3. Reading through everything they posted, it sounds like more than likely someone at Capcom said, we want you to work on a new Street Fighter, and somewhere along the lines, new Street Fighter or the next Street Fighter ended up getting interpreted as Street Fighter 3. I mean, think about it. this was before the Alpha games, this was before the EX games, so at that point, if someone at Capcom said, we want you to make the next Street Fighter, of course the guys at Incredible Technologies were probably going to interpret that as, you're making Street Fighter 3. They were probably popping champagne balls thinking they just landed the biggest deal of all time before Capcom had to step in and go, what, Street Fighter 3? No, 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 you're going to digitize Jean-Claude Van Damme, good luck with that. So yeah, I don't believe this game was ever going to actually be Street Fighter 3. There's no way Capcom was going to do something as stupid as leave development of their biggest sequel of all time to developers on the other side of the planet who didn't know what they were doing. Why would they need to do that when they could find developers who didn't know what they were doing right in their own home office? No, Street Fighter 3's development actually began in 1994, with Capcom reaching out to legendary developer and producer of Street Fighter 2 in the Alpha series, Noritaka Funamizu, and they told him to get to work on Street Fighter 3. And he said no. 
Yeah, Noritaka Funamizu was burned out on Street Fighter at this time, and this was before the hellish development of the Alpha games. Imagine how bad he must have felt after that. Now, he would agree to come on as a producer, but he wasn't going to be hands-on with this game. He would basically be a producer in name only. In an interview he did for Street Fighter's 15th anniversary, he stated, quote, I had a very strong attachment to Street Fighter 2 Super Turbo, and I decided I didn't want to be very involved with the making of Street Fighter 3. Partly it was the pressure, but also the fact that I felt my vision for Street Fighter clashed with the rest of the teams. So okay, Capcom now needed someone new to start up Street Fighter 3. And at this very same time, Capcom developer Tomoshi Sadamoto had begun working on a brand new fighting game. Sadamoto had previously worked on Magic Sword and Dungeons and & Dragons, and upon hearing that, I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn Sadamoto was something of a fantasy fan, and this new fighting game would be themed around a fantasy world going under the name New Generation. Name that to celebrate the new generation of software that Capcom was going to start using around this time, and because many of the people working on this game were brand new employees to Capcom. However, things were not going well on this game, as Capcom artist Akira Yasuda, in an interview with Polygon for the Street Fighter Oral History series, said he remembered seeing the designs for the game and said, quote, The characters didn't seem to have a lot of personality, so I propose they add Ryu and turn the game into a Street Fighter game. At the time, there were team members who weren't really open to or supportive of that idea. Oh, really? You went up to someone and said their game looks bad, so they should just scrap it and make it a new Street Fighter? Yeah, I have no idea why they wouldn't respond positively to that. Well, guess what? That's exactly what happened. Capcom decided to drop New Generation as its own original title, and instead took what they had built and started turning it into Street Fighter 3. Hey, you know what? I'm getting a crazy sense of deja vu right now. What was it that I said in that first episode about when Capcom tried to turn Final Fight into the next Street Fighter? Unfortunately for Capcom, this rock-solid plan of just calling whatever game they had ready the new Street Fighter had one small problem. This looked and played nothing like Street Fighter. Huh. Why am I suddenly remembering that now? I wonder if there was a moral behind that story. So, it's 1994 and Capcom just told Sadamoto that he needed to turn the game he was working on into Street Fighter 3. Now, this was the exact same year that Capcom also started working on Street Fighter Alpha, so even though the timeline gets a little bit fuzzy here and it's not quite clear which game began development first, if I had to guess, I'd say that Alpha was probably greenlit shortly after New Generation became Street Fighter 3, which is probably why Capcom started working on a prequel game rather than telling the Alpha team to just make Street Fighter 3. Also, it's probably why they only gave them three months of development time. They didn't want these games coming out at the exact same time. I mean, you don't want too many Street Fighter games all coming out that close to each other. Remember I said that? So okay, it's 1994 and development on Street Fighter 3 has begun. So why did the game still take another three years to come out? These days you hear a fine game takes three years to come out and you think, yeah, that seems about right. But back then, many fighting games took less than one year to make. So what was the holdup? A lot of things, actually. For starters, Capcom was going through a massive restructuring in the mid-90s. At this point, Capcom had still largely been a tightly knit group of developers all working together with one or two people overseeing most of their games. But as the company saw bigger and bigger successes, they started to expand, putting out more games faster and focusing on a larger audience. So they had to adjust. So after hiring a consultant firm to give them some advice, Capcom decided that from this point on, each game would have its own producer. So they promoted Sadamoto to being a producer on Street Fighter 3. Sadamoto had no experience being a producer. Well, that's okay, because I'm sure that with his team of dedicated developers, they would be able to figure all this out. You should know by now that anytime time that I say something like that, I've got some bad news on the way. It was estimated that between 70 and 80% of the staff on this game had no experience making fighting games. So yeah, production on this game slowed way down as everyone tried to figure out what the heck they were doing. Well, luckily, no further curveballs were coming their way. What did I just say about me phrasing stuff like that? When talking about the Alpha games, I mentioned that Capcom was moving from the CP system to the CP2. Well, at this point in time, video games were moving away from pixels and into the third dimension. 
But as we just mentioned with the EX games, Capcom didn't really know if they could make 3D fighting games, and they didn't even know if it really worked for the genre. So while the entire industry was moving towards the third dimension, Capcom decided they were going to make the best looking 2D sprites they possibly could, which led to the development of the CP3 system, the most advanced sprite-based arcade system to date. And Street Fighter 3 was going to be the big game to show this brand new system off. So this new Street Fighter had a team of developers who had to learn how to make fighting games, and they had to learn how to use this new arcade system, and they were working under a producer who had to learn how to be a producer. Oh, and before we forget, because Sadamoto had been bumped up from designer to producer, that meant they had to hire on brand new designers. So they replaced Sadamoto with the tag team duo of Yasuhiro Seto and Tomonori Omura, two breakout stars for Capcom who had previously worked on such titles as... as... Um... Oh. Oh god no, this... This was their first game, wasn't it? The lead designers on the follow-up to Street Fighter 2, Capcom's biggest game ever, were two guys who had never made a video game before. Okay, this is really hard to salvage, but um... Uh, hey, just because they hadn't made a game yet didn't mean that they didn't have a bright future ahead of them. Omura would go on to work on Capcom vs. SNK 2, and that's an amazing title. He didn't really work on anything else aside from that, but I mean, that's still something. And Seto would go on to be a writer, designer, and producer on such titles as Resident Evil Umbrella Chronicles, Resident Evil 6, Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. Okay, this is actually making things worse. Luckily, Capcom finally realized things were going south for this game, so they add one more developer to the staff, Shinchiro Obata, who had experience working on fighting games as he served as a planner on Darkstalkers 3, which had previously released in the year of not yet the game was still in development. Yeah, the only guy they could get to help out on Street Fighter 3 staff was someone who had to divide his attention with another game that was currently in production. And I mentioned that Street Fighter Alpha had a similar situation, but that developer was an experienced fighting game pro. The very first fighting game that Obata worked on was Darkstalkers 3. This team was in so much trouble that the guy with only two months of experience was considered a seasoned pro. But Obata was still a valuable addition to the team because he was, and I can't stress this enough, one of the only people working on Street Fighter 3 who knew what a fighting game was. And according to that Polygon Oral History of Street Fighter article, Obata joined this team like Troy Barnes coming back from picking up a stack of pizzas. He commented that not only did he have no idea why Capcom would fill this team with people that didn't know anything about fighting games, but he described the experience by saying, quote, So by the time I came around, the team didn't really have a very clear concept of what they wanted to do with the game. They had created a lot of animation patterns, and they wanted the hits to feel like they had real heft behind them to make it look cool when you took damage. But the problem was the team had no idea what kind of mechanics should go into the game in order to make it an interesting fighting game. There was no plan for that, and there weren't enough moves for each character, so I ended up joining the team when the game was in that kind of a state. Yeah, this really feels like when you and your buddies get together and you start talking about how great it would be to make a fighting game, but none of you have ever done a day of programming in your life. Well, my buddy Steve drew this really cool picture of a guy throwing out a fireball. We can turn that into a game, right? Uh, okay, but how does the combat work? Oh, you know, like you punch them and there's a lot of heft behind it, so the hit animation looks cool. Yeah, that's not a mechanic. That doesn't mean anything. What do you actually do in this game? So Obato was brought into a game that didn't know what it wanted to do. And to make matters worse, because they were working on brand new hardware, the team decided to just keep throwing everything at the wall to see what stuck because they didn't know what this new hardware was capable of. At one point, they actually tried to put mocap animation into this game. Why would you do that? How much time and money did you spend on the mocap idea before you threw it out because you realized that was a horrible idea? 
Yeah, the early years of Street Fighter 3 was basically them just making things up as they went along. Luckily, the team would continue to grow with more developers who had fighting game experience. Because thankfully, Capcom decided not to make Street Fighter 3 the very first game on the CP3. Instead, they were going to test the waters on this brand new system with a brand new title, Red Earth. And as that game's production finally wrapped up, many of its staff was able to move over to Street Fighter 3, giving them the boost in manpower and experience that they needed. But it didn't stop there. As Street Fighter Alpha 2's development came to an end, some of the staff on that game migrated over here as well, including Hitotoshi Ishizawa, who would become another developer on the game and who would also face the exact same frustration that Obata did. In that Street Fighter 15th anniversary interview that I mentioned earlier, he said that when he came on board, quote, I was originally just there to help out, but nobody explained to me what we were supposed to be doing. What was the concept of the game? I kind of got a sense of what they wanted just by feeling things out, but ultimately, there was this big question of what direction we should go in. I mentioned the stoic vibe of Street Fighter 2, and they said they wanted to continue that. But that was all they had. So just to sum up where we are right now, Street Fighter 2, biggest game of this generation. People want a sequel. So Capcom asked the producer of Street Fighter 2 to return, and he says no. So desperate for ideas, Capcom gets somebody who had never made a fighting game before, but was currently working on a fighting game that everyone said looked bad, and they said, let's just shove Ryu in there and make it Street Fighter 3. Then they brought that Street Fighter 2 producer back, but made him work on this game while also working on a prequel game that had a far more hellish development schedule, meaning he had to focus all of his attention on that game, basically leaving the Street Fighter 3 staff to fend for themselves. They then promote the guy who had never made a fighting game to a producer role before, despite the fact that he had no idea how to be a producer. They then filled his old position with two guys, neither of whom had ever made a video game. This team, made up mostly of people who didn't know anything about fighting games, now had to make the brand new Street Fighter on a brand new arcade system while throwing out there every idea they possibly could, including using mocap for some reason because fuck it, nothing matters anymore. After working like this for years, brand new developers who did know how to make a fighting game were brought on and asked them, okay, so what have you got so far? And they said, well, we've decided we wanted to feel like Street Fighter. I want to make sure that we all understand right now. This was the sequel to Street Fighter 2. This is how Capcom ran development on the sequel to their biggest game ever. I cannot stress that enough. But after all this, Street Fighter 3 finally had people on its team that knew how to make a Street Fighter and they helped the devs flesh out the ideas that they had for new mechanics. The team had decided that they wanted some kind of a mechanic that played into the spacing of each fighter and could come with a lot of variety. But that was all they had. According to Funimizu, the team had ideas, but they were too vague and they couldn't put into execution what they were envisioning. Probably because, again, most of the people working on this game had no experience with fighting games. But when the new developers came on, they took the ideas that the original team had and they were able to craft this game's standout mechanic, the parry system. With this mechanic, if you're being attacked, instead of blocking, you can press forward at the exact moment the attack is about to connect, and instead, you'll end up negating the attack, meaning you won't take any chip damage. And in very specific situations, you'll also get the tiniest moment to counterattack. But beyond this mechanic, these new developers also helped the team create super moves. Yes, Street Fighter 3 was originally going to release without super moves. Something that every 2D fighting game had included for almost half a decade at this point. This is how inexperienced with fighting games these developers were. However, Obata would help them polish this even more, coming up with the idea of super cancels, which allowed you to cancel a regular or special move into a super. These days, super cancels are a pretty common thing in most fighting games, but back then, this was really advanced stuff at the time. So these new developers did everything they could to try and help this team get this game made, but eventually, time was up. Funamizu said that he had to eventually tell them, quote, if you keep going at this pace, the game won't come out for another five years, which meant they were forced to release whatever they had ready at the time. So, uh, how was it?
Street Fighter 3 New Generation was released in February 1997, and it was... certainly a game. Okay, honestly, as much of a mess as this development was, I still think the game is... okay. The punches and kicks are kind of slow and not as smooth as the Alpha series or Super Turbo, and there's tons of stuff that feels like it should combo but doesn't, and there's plenty of times I threw out an attack and was shocked that didn't actually hit the opponent, and there's stuff that feels like it should be punishable but it isn't, and there's stuff that feels like it should be safe but isn't. Where is I going with this? All right, but uh, you know what? It functions, the game works, and after hearing about this development, I think that's the best you could have hoped for. I will say I do enjoy that the game lets you choose which super you want to start with, with different supers giving you different amounts of super bar and doing different levels of damage, which does give each character a little bit of variety. And the game does look great, the CP3 system really was showing off what it could do. You can go frame by frame and see just how much work was put into even the tiniest action. And when you do a super the screen freezes and I love how it looks when you hit the opponent, then cancel that hit into a super and you just see the opponent frozen there in mid-damage animation? Oh! Oh, that lets you know you just did something good! And the stages are pretty good too. They're not that detailed, but they do still have some decent personality in them. I do enjoy that some of them even transition from one stage to another in between matches. And hey, I gotta point out the Hot Springs stage, which has Chun-Li in the background, that's a nice cameo, as well as Lin Kurosawa, who is once again just far enough away from the camera to avoid legal problems. And speaking of Chun-Li, sadly, she is not in this roster. But don't worry, neither is anyone else. The developers originally wanted the whole cast to be completely different characters, because if this was going to finally be a brand new Street Fighter, they figured they would make the game feel completely new. So, for the first two years of development, the game was only focusing on brand new characters, until Yoshiki Okamoto, the lead producer of Street Fighter 2, told them, What the hell are you doing? This is Street Fighter! It's gotta have Ryu in there! He probably said it nicer than that. Then again, this was two years into development, they still had nothing to show for it, so I don't know, maybe he didn't. So Ogamoto told them that they had to include the older characters. But Funamizu, the guy who, again, I would like to remind you, said he didn't even want to be on this game, and he said that his vision clashed with what this new team was working on, stepped up and said that this team had worked hard on these characters over the past two years, so he wanted to respect their vision. That's kind of a standout moment for Funamizu. I would also like to remind you that Funamizu on the Alpha games was the guy who kept berating Hideaki Itsuno every single day by telling him they had no talent and had no sins. So, he's a complicated guy, that Funamizu. So they compromised. All the new characters that had been created would remain, but they would also include two returning characters. Wait, only two returning characters? Oh my god, Die Hard Game Fan Magazine was right! Where's Shadow Lou, Capcom? We know he exists. Why are you hiding him? Okay, that's a joke. Obviously, Die Hard Game Fan Magazine was not right about which two characters would return. Or anything else, including thinking Die Hard Game Fan Magazine was a good name. No, the two returning characters would be Ryu, as well as Ken, because they could reuse many of Ryu's sprites to make him an easy addition. And I gotta say, I'm really glad that Ken made it back because, hey, they're the only two characters who have been in every Street Fighter. It's kind of tradition to keep them around. But as for the new characters, well, they're kind of a mixed bag. Not because any of them are bad, I actually like most of these characters. But the debate over whether or not these characters actually feel like Street Fighter characters has been raging on for years. And considering that many of them were made by people who didn't know anything about Street Fighter, yeah, that kind of backs up a lot of people's arguments. I mean, each of them do have a ton of personality and style behind them. You look at them and you instantly get a sense of who these characters are, but you look at Street Fighter 2 and each of these characters felt unique, but they also felt like they all fit together. They felt like they all came from the same world. The only real exception is Blanca, but everyone else, Gael, Chun-Li, Zangief, Bison, they all feel like they could come from the exact same game. But you look at these brand new characters, and as cool as they are, Ninja Girl Ibuki and Classic Gentleman Boxer Dudley and Science Experiment Necro and Cool Kid Yoon, they all kind of feel like they come from completely different games. In fact, now that we know that this game started as a fantasy-themed fighter, I look at some of these characters and wonder if they might have been meant for that original pitch. I can totally see Oro being some crazy old hermit in some ancient mythical land. 
Although speaking of that, if you do want to know more about the original designs for some of these characters, make sure to check out the video that we did about cut Street Fighter characters. You can find it in the card popping up right now, and believe me, there were some real weirdos in this game. So let's dive into these characters, starting with the premise. A secret society known as the Illuminati has emerged with their leader Gil, claiming that he will bring balance to the world. So he sets up a tournament to find those strong enough to join his ranks. As you can probably tell from that description, Gil has something of a god complex and views everyone as being beneath him, but not in the evil superiority way that Bison did, more of like a cult leader who just believes that he has a higher calling. As for the playable characters, I already mentioned that Ryu and Ken were returning, but they both had brand new moves. For example, Ryu now has the power to charge up his Hadouken with electricity popping off of it, which will be something that comes up in the lore of these games way later in this series. But with Ryu and Ken now being pushed into the supporting roles, our new lead character is Alex. He's a tough-as-nails wrestler from the mean streets of New York, orphaned as a boy and raised by a friend of his father's named Tom. Tom is a retired soldier who taught Alex how to fight, and between this game and Onimusha 3, I don't know who it was, but somebody at Capcom was a huge John Renault fan because Tom's appearance was taken directly from this French actor. But thanks to Tom's impressive military background, Gil sought him out to test his strength. Tom was then put into the hospital with declining health, and now Alex had to set out to get his revenge. I really dig Alex. Personality-wise, he's gruff, quiet, kind of a meathead, but behind that serious expression, he's got a good heart to him. It kind of reminds me of Sylvester Stallone in the first Rocky. And as for his playstyle, he's a grappler, which was a very interesting style to give to the protagonist of your fighting game. Most protags are meant to be as accessible as possible, while grapplers are considered one of the more difficult fighting styles to learn. But Alex does have several adjustments that make him more welcoming to brand new players. For example, his grab only requires you to do a half circle on the controller rather than the full 180 of characters like Zangief. And he's got an arm chop that can turn the opponent around and stun them, giving you a perfect opportunity to go in and grab them. Then from Britain, there's Dudley. He's a classically trained, gentlemanly boxer who cares about sophistication and grace. He's built like a tank, but he's still delicate enough that he can drink tea with his boxing gloves on. Mechanically speaking, Dudley would go on to be one of the biggest favorites from these games because he's got a wide range of moves that are great for different situations. He's got SRKs for anti-airs, rush-ins to close the distance, he's got counters for opponents that won't stop attacking, and as this franchise would go on, he would keep getting more tools with every single game. He's after Gil because the Illuminati was snatching up as much money and resources as they could, and they ended up stealing Dudley's car, and now he wanted it back. Next, Ibuki is a young girl who is a member of a clan of ninjas, and despite being so talented, she just wants to leave the ninja life behind and be a normal high school girl. Unfortunately, her clan has different plans for her as they send her out to retrieve files from Gil. She fights the way you'd expect a ninja character to fight, fast and agile. Then from Russia, you've got Necro. He was a man who was kidnapped by the Illuminati and experimented upon until he was turned into a pale mutant. Mechanically, he's sort of a combination of Dalsim and Blanca because he can stretch his limbs and electrocute his body, although when it comes to his personality, he's nothing like either of them. He's got a far more aggressive punk-style attitude that's all his own. The rest of the cast doesn't really have anything to do with Gil or his secret society, but they're still pretty interesting and important in their own way. First, there's Oro, a 150-year-old man who is a powerful martial artist that's hyped up as being the strongest fighter on the planet. He's got a real Yoda energy behind him. You know, that short, funny-looking character who isn't very serious, but they could actually take out anyone with just one finger. In fact, he only uses one hand to fight. He does that in the story because he wants to try and even the odds with the opponent and give them a fighting chance. But the real reason why he only uses one hand is because he was inspired by Helio Grazzi, the founder of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, who once broke an arm during a match, but refused to tap out. Side note, if you ever want to go down a really weird rabbit hole studying someone's biography, spend a couple hours reading up on Helio Grazzi when he got a free afternoon. He sounds like what would happen if a 90s fighting game character somehow escaped the arcade machines and became real. Then on the other end of this roster, we move from an all-powerful old guy to a young guy who's still trying to figure everything out. From Brazil, we have Sean Matsuda, who came from a family of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu masters, but instead he's decided to follow Ken Masters, who has taken him on as his student. Sean is a massive fan favorite character. To this day, I constantly hear people asking for Sean to come back which is kind of shocking to me because Sean was meant to be a joke character. He was supposed to be a screw-up, which is why one of his supers is just a normal Hadouken, he's got wind quotes telling people not to call him Dan, and he gets his butt kicked in every single one of his endings. 
In fact, Sadamoto even said in an interview on Capcom's website for Street Fighter V's release that they made Sean specifically to be a handicap, so that if someone was playing against someone and they were much better than them, they could pick Sean to try and make it an even fight. He says this like it was supposed to be a complimentary, friendly thing, but I gotta tell you, if you went up against someone at the arcade and they said, hey, you're so much worse than me, I'm going to pick the bad character so that way you have a shot, uh, you would probably never recover from that burn and you would basically be laughed out of the arcade. Yeah, I'm really beginning to think what everyone said was true and Sadamoto did not play a lot of fine games. But yes, Sean was meant to be the weighted clothing of Street Fighter characters. However, despite these initial intentions, a lot of people really took to Sean, partly because his more youthful design struck a chord with people, and because even though they did not plan this, his playstyle is actually pretty fun. At least in this first game. He uses classic Shoto style moves, but he gets a little bit more aggressive with it, like he'll combo a short Yukon into a punch or he'll tackle his opponent to the ground. Then there's Yun and Yang, a two for one deal. Yun and Yang are two brothers who protect their neighborhood in Hong Kong, Yun being the more energetic and reckless brother, and Yang being the more serious and stoic one. And if you were a kid in the 90s who watched a whole lot of Toonami, you might recognize them because their designs were taken from Duo and Troa from Gundam Wing. Although everything else about their inspiration might have come from another source. You'll notice that I'm referring to these characters together, and that's because only Yun appears on the select screen, but Yang is a palette swap for him. And this has made a lot of people believe that Yun and Yang were originally inspired by Fei Long. If you'll remember from our first episode, when Street Fighter 2 added four brand new characters to the roster, originally DJ wasn't there. Instead, Fei Long had a brother who used his exact same moves with slight tweaks to them, and used his exact same body with a different head on. Yeah, a fighter from Hong Kong with a brother who used his exact same moves and had the exact same body but with a different head on it. You see where I'm going with this. However, I looked around and I can't find any actual interviews from anyone at Capcom confirming that Yun and Yang came from scrapped ideas for Fei Long's brother, and considering this game went through multiple years of production involving many developers, many of whom had nothing to do with Street Fighter, and many of whom didn't even know what fighting games were, yeah, I'm going to keep this one filed under rumors. Speaking of rumors that you shouldn't report on until you have a proper source, that brings us to the final new character, Elena. Elena is another fan favorite. She's a young girl from Kenya who is very upbeat and loves dancing and is traveling the world because she just wants to make friends with new people. Just like with Sakura, people love upbeat characters, so Elena's personality definitely spoke to people, but also her animations are probably the most detailed in the entire game. Her idol stance alone probably took as long to animate as Alex's entire moveset. In fact, one of her victory animations was even rotoscoped from the David Lee Roth music video, Just a Gigolo. So yeah, lots of attention was put into this character. However, there is something that I have to address. Two years ago, we did our Darkstalkers retrospective, and in that video, I said that Elena's origin came from a scrapped idea for the character Felicia. Originally, Felicia was going to be a tall woman from Kenya, and considering that both Elena and Felicia love to make friends and they love to dance, a rumor has been going around for years now that this idea for Felicia was the inspiration for Elena. But since making that video, I've discovered, yeah, that's not actually true. I even went back and checked the article where I saw that story the first time and found they didn't quote a source for that Felicia-Elena fact. They quoted sources for everything else, but not for that, and I have now come to realize you really should not report on things that don't quote a source. But when researching for this video, I found notes in Street Fighter 3's soundtrack where Capcom artist Akira Akimun Yasuda revealed the true origin of Elena. It turns out that this fan-favorite character actually came from... Akira Akimun Yasuda just won an African character who used capoeira. That's it. And Elena's body was based on model and future actress Yuki Uchida, so yeah, it has absolutely nothing to do with Felicia or Darkstalkers, so... There you go, I'm sorry for pointing out there's some false information a couple years back. I've now learned my lesson, you should always check your sources, and then check your sources' sources. Although, speaking of not believing everything that you read, those were all the characters in the game, but there was one more fighter that players would be teased with two months after the game came out. Shing Long. 
Yes, he returns. In April of 1997, EGM, the very same people who so many years ago before this had started the rumor of a mysterious man named Shen Long, who secretly was unlockable in Street Fighter 2, would return with yet another April Fool's joke, saying that Shen Long was in Street Fighter 3, and the way to unlock him was to get six perfects. Not nearly as stupid as go 10 rounds with Bison without either of you hitting each other. Now, not only was this the exact same April Fool's prank that they pulled so many years ago, but they even made the first letter of each sentence spell out April Fool's. And yet, people still believed it. In fact, there's actually a rumor that the Capcom USA guys had to contact Capcom Japan and ask them if this was real. And while I can't confirm if that is true or not, I will say that a month ago when we put out that video on cut Street Fighter characters, someone actually did contact me and asked why we didn't mention Xing Long being cut from Street Fighter 3. So yes, I can confirm, people did believe this. As the arcade ladder itself, it's relatively simple. There's only six fights, no special rival matches, no special dialogue, no bonus stages this time. Although something odd that I have never seen anyone bring up, if you and your opponent each win a fight and then you get a double KO in round three, then instead of you going into a tiebreaker or a round four, a group of random women referred to as the Judgment Girls will come out and they'll just decide on a winner. There are eight different members of the Judgment Girls and you'll get a different combination of three each time, but I have no idea how they're deciding on a winner. Seems kind of BS to me that the game doesn't give you a way to fight it out and instead they just choose a winner, but it's so rare that you get a double KO that you'll probably never run into this. Like I said, I've heard people talk about Street Fighter 3 for decades now and I have never heard anyone bring up the Judgment Girls. But aside from that one very interesting mechanic, there's nothing really unique about this arcade ladder. Six fights that aren't too difficult, but still provide you with an even challenge. Until you get to the fight with Gil in a sea of fire. Gil is arguably the toughest boss in this franchise outside of the Secret Akuma fights, but nothing is as hard as the Secret Akuma fights. He can zone you out with projectiles, he can rush you down with charging attacks, he's got throws, and every hit he does builds your stun meter all the way up. And many of his attacks hit more than once, so even if you know how to parry them, you now have to know how to parry them twice. And speaking of the parry mechanic, he is so fast, it feels like it is next to impossible to punish anything that you block. It is very clear they want you to use that shiny brand new parry mechanic. Too bad that parry mechanic is just... <sighs> it's okay. Yeah, it's a good idea, but in this game, the amount of time a character is frozen after you parry them is so low, and sometimes you can even end up pushing a character away when you parry them, making it really hard to actually capitalize on this mechanic. But if you do master the parry and you learn to watch all of his attacks, he will eventually go down. He seems tough, but once you learn how to play the game, he's not that bad. Actually, you know what? On second thought, fuck you, Gil. You're the worst. Yes, in the ultimate insult, Gil doesn't have a super. But if you knock him out while his super bar is full, he will resurrect himself with max health. You can interrupt him as he's resurrecting, and it will stop his life from increasing, but considering he pushes you away as he heals, it is easier said than done. Also, I know I'm going to sound incredibly petty right now, but while I'm complaining about this Gil fight, I hate Gil's design. I'm sure it has its fans, but it's just so basic. I get he's based off the Greek fighting style Pancration, which is typically performed in the nude, but just giving a guy a loincloth and nothing else is so bland. And the way they decided to spice him up was by splitting his body into red and blue to show that he has control over fire and ice, which on paper is actually a really cool idea, but the end result is so lame. They didn't even come up with an interesting design with these two colors. They just divide him down the middle like two angry roommates splitting their apartment in a sitcom. The reason why Capcom went with this design was a flex. It was because they wanted to show off the power of the CP3. They wanted to show people that, get this, 
they could actually flip a character model. Ooh. Yeah, this was something of an impossibility before this. Remember DJ in Street Fighter 2? Ever wonder why he had maximum Ren Eyes pants? It's because that's one of the only words that they could come up with that was spelled the same way when you mirror the image. So Gil was designed to look like this just to show off how far they'd come. Capcom designed him this way so that way they could turn to the audience and say, "Oh yeah, he's blue on one side and red on the other. We can flip that guy back and forth all day long. Woo, CP3 unit, y'all. To the younger people out there, we were far more easily impressed by things back in the 90s. This is kind of like when your great-grandparents got freaked out seeing a train come at them in a movie theater for the very first time. As for the endings, not a whole lot happens here. Ryu keeps wandering the world looking for fights, while Ken is challenging some mysterious fighter named Mel, only for Ken to receive a fatal blow as his wife looks on. But surprise, Mel is actually Ken and Eliza's son, and Ken learns he should probably wait till his kid is about a foot taller to start training him. By the way, fun fact, Ken's son Mel did not first appear in this game. No, just like Cammy's Killer B outfit, Mel first appeared in X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Which just tells me that Street Fighter 3 was in development for so long that Capcom was able to get a whole crossover game out the door while Street Fighter 3 was still trying to come up with their character endings. But as for the new characters, Alex beats Gil and Tom wakes up from his coma, Dudley beats Gil and asks for his car back and Gil gives it to him, and Ibuki beats Gil and asks him for the secret files he was holding and he agrees to give it to her as well. That's one thing that makes Gil kind of unique. He might be crazy, but he does have a code. If you beat him, he will honor your agreement. As for the rest of the cast, Sean challenges Ryu, thinking that if he can beat him, then he'll prove how good he is to Ken. He does not beat him. Elena goes to school in Japan to make new friends, something that would be fleshed out in the comics as she ended up becoming friends with Ibuki and a future character, Makoto. Oro flies off on a plane, and he says that none of the other fighters felt like they had any potential, except for that Ryu kid, so Oro decides he's going to train him into a proud, strong warrior. Yun and Yang return to Hong Kong, where they declare that they've proven that their kung fu is the strongest. And lastly, Necro is trapped by Gil in an exploding base, only for a mysterious young girl named Effie to appear and rescue him. Effie is a quiet girl who was also experimented on by the Illuminati, and during these tests, she and Necro met and would eventually fall in love. The two of them escape this base in time, and they ride off with Necro, saying that they're free now to go and live their own lives. Which is one of the reasons that I really dig these two. They had everything taken away from them, only to find each other, and now they're going out there to carve their own path. I love stuff like that. I also love that this game seemed to want to give each character not just their own backstory and motivations, but also they wanted to build up a supporting cast for each character. Alex has Tom, Necro has Effie, Ibuki has her pet raccoon dog and another ninja girl named Sarai, and Yoon has Hoimei, a headstrong girl who works at Yoon's grandfather's restaurant and has a crush on Yoon, but he's too busy being a radical 90s kid to notice. Heck, even Gil has Colleen, his personal assistant who follows him around. I always love when fine games give their characters their own supporting cast. It makes them feel more real, like they have their own lives and they're not just a bunch of mechanics and button inputs. So, Street Fighter 3 was finally here. The game that fighting game fans had been waiting for for years had arrived. So, how was it received? Not well. I don't know if it is even possible to fully sum up what a flop Street Fighter 3 was because it bombed on almost every level. From a sales perspective, the official numbers are a bit difficult to figure out, but the highest estimates are only 10,000 units and the lowest estimates are only 1,000. And that is worldwide. To put that into perspective, that very same year, King of Fighters 97 came out, and according to Famitsu, nearly 20,000 copies of that arcade release were shipped out in the very first week. Akira Yasuda would go on to say, quote, I remember seeing the numbers and just being really surprised at how the game just wasn't selling. It felt like we'd created the worst selling game ever at Capcom. It felt awful. But this was Street Fighter 3. This was one of the most highly anticipated sequels of all time. How could it possibly have sold so poorly? Well, whenever people talk about the low sales of this game, there's one answer you will constantly hear. The roster. I can't tell you how many people I have seen over the years say the reason this game sold poorly was because the roster was almost completely new characters. In fact, there are so many people out there who connect the game's low sales directly to the roster that to this day, anytime that someone suggests that a fighting game should introduce more new characters, 
or they criticize the game for playing things too safe with its roster by bringing back too many old characters, I will always see someone standing up and saying, oh what, you want another Street Fighter 3? Introduce too many new characters and that's how you get Street Fighter 3 to happen. Okay, let's actually address this. Yes, the lack of many memorable faces certainly did impact this game's sales. Having only Ryu and Ken return and dropping all the other old staples and famous faces did certainly hurt this game and it did make it harder for people to accept it as the next Street Fighter. But that is not the main reason this game didn't sell. Hell, it's not even in the top five reasons why this game didn't sell. Saying the roster is why this game didn't sell is like saying, oh, the reason your house burned down was because you left too many candles out. Meanwhile, you had faulty wiring, your stove was left on, you were smoking in bed, you had a collection of oily rags just laying on the ground, and you were playing with your brand new blowtorch. Yes, the candles certainly contributed, but I'm pretty sure there were a whole bunch of other factors at play here. For starters, as I said, everyone kept waiting on Street Fighter 3. They were salivating for it. Sure, we got other Street Fighter games, but they needed to see that number 3. So when Capcom released this official sequel, fans finally got that 3. And nothing else. Yeah, the original release of Street Fighter 3 just said 3 on it. Which is a hell of a flex. That was basically Capcom just saying, listen, we all know what you were waiting on, so there. We don't even need to say Street Fighter. Turns out you needed to actually say Street Fighter. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna say that nobody out there understood this was Street Fighter 3. You got Ryu right there on the front of it, just staring right back at you. Yes, some people out there knew this was Street Fighter 3. But there were a lot of people out there who just didn't make the connection. Believe it or not, there were people who looked at this arcade machine and just went, three? What the heck is 3? And why is Ryu in this game? And even if you did look at this machine and you did understand it was Street Fighter 3, just seeing the word 3, it doesn't really get you hyped up. You see that big Street Fighter logo and then the number 3, that makes you realize, oh my goodness, it's finally here. The thing I've been waiting for has finally arrived. You look at the word 3, it just doesn't have that same effect. Just think about being in a crowded arcade, loaded with machines that all have these big, glorious logos on them, and then here's this thing that just says three on it. It is not an appealing arcade cabinet. People are not lining up to play three. Next up was competition. There were so many other fighting games out there at this time, and let me just say, in recent years, I've had a real problem with the way that a lot of people talk about fighting game releases. So many people believe that you can't have too many fighting games out there at once because they'll take attention away from each other. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely truth to that. That is totally a thing that will happen. But I hear people saying things like, you can't put out a weekend long beta right now, there's a new game coming out next month. Dude, we can't even get open beta weekends within a month of a new release without people saying it's too close? People panic way too much about fighting game oversaturation. We ain't even close to that happening today. But we were definitely close to it back in 1997. There were so many games for people to choose from back then. But hey, this was Street Fighter. It had its own built-in diehard audience. Yes, it did. And that diehard audience had so many other Street Fighters to choose from. I mentioned in the last episode that I was originally going to cover Street Fighter Alpha, Street Fighter EX, and Street Fighter 3 all in the same episode, and some of you wondered why I'd want to talk about all of them at the exact same time? Because Capcom was releasing them all at the exact same time! Except that Alpha was now on its second game with a larger roster and refined gameplay, EX had something new in the graphics, Street Fighter 3 came out after both of them with a smaller roster and much worse gameplay. If you went to the arcade, sure, you'd want to try out the brand new thing, but when the brand new thing wasn't as big or as good as that thing that you knew you already liked, and you were playing these at an arcade, meaning you had limited time and money to spend there, you'd probably swap back to that thing that you knew you liked with way more content. Putting out their three Street Fighters at the exact same time was a huge misstep. So putting out four of them was an even bigger mistake. Cause it's Marvel, baby! Yeah, this time the Marvel vs. Capcom series was blowing up for Capcom. 
Except at this point, it wasn't really Marvel vs. Capcom just yet. No, at this point, it was X-Men vs. Street Fighter! And Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter! Both of which were also released within a year of Street Fighter 3. Meaning, even if you wanted to play a brand new Street Fighter game, if you had gotten tired of the Alpha games and the EX games and you wanted something brand new, you still had two options that you could choose from and one of them featured Wolverine and Spider-Man. And I'm sorry, Street Fighter 3, but I only got a couple of dollars to spend here and, and did you see Ryu and Cyclops shaking hands over there? Just look at that handshake! I can't say no to that handshake! Oh man, they are shaking the hell out of those hands right now. So for all the people who said Street Fighter 3's cast is why nobody played it, I'll be real with you. I think the cast might actually have helped this game because between the Alpha games, the EX games, and the Versus games, at least Street Fighter 3 had a cast that made it stand out. At least that made the game different. But to make matters worse, not only was Street Fighter 3 competing against three other Street Fighters at the exact same time, they were competing on a stage that was crumbling beneath them. The 90s fighting game scene was largely centered around the arcades, but most people tend to agree that it was around 1997 when the arcades started to die. The next three years saw a steep decline in arcade business as home consoles became more popular, and many other fighting game franchises now saw their biggest sales not coming from the arcades, but from home releases. Well, Capcom had been the kings of the arcades, and now those kings were turned into that old guy in Florida who refuses to leave when a hurricane is coming. Really, Charlie, there is not much time. I've been in this square pert near 30 seasons, and I ain't leaving now. In an interview with Gamus Magazine, Noritaka Funamizu talked about Street Fighter 3 and its future installments and said, quote, We wanted to signal to players that this was a game you could only play at game centers and convey our hope that the tradition of live arcade matches will continue to live on for a long time to come. They did not. The arcade scene was on the way out, and most other fighting games realized that. They put their games on the arcade now to build up hype, then they got all their sales from the home releases a few months later. But remember how I said the CP3 was pushing the limit of what games could do with sprites? Yeah, maybe they were pushing it a little too much. CP3 games were so detailed, it was impossible to port them to any home console at the time. Street Fighter 3 came out in 1997, and it wouldn't get a home release until 1999, and that was on the Dreamcast, a console that sold so poorly if you do a YouTube search on it, most of the results will be video essays about why it failed. So okay, the game sold poorly, but that doesn't mean that it was bad. If the combat was good, then it could still reach an audience, maybe develop a cult following that grows over time. And that's where the other shoe dropped. This game was lambasted for its gameplay. I said that I thought it was okay, but admittedly, I'm mostly saying that because I know of what the development team went through making it, and I can see where the game could go from here. I'm mostly just being nice. Everyone else was not being nice. The developers at Capcom even knew the game wasn't that good. As I said, they put the game out because they realized eventually they just had to release it, working or not. In fact, unlike Street Fighter 2 and the Alpha games, which got additional versions because of how well they were received, Capcom knew before Street Fighter 3 even came out that they were going to have to make an additional version just to listen to the feedback and fix the problems. And that feedback? Oof. In that 15th anniversary interview, Funumizu described the fallout as, quote, The criticism was harsh and unrelenting. People were like, what is this? We waited so long and this is what you're calling Street Fighter 3? Man, I feel bad for Funumizu. He didn't even want to work on this game, and now he was on the Street Fighter 3 apology tour. In that same interview, Ishizawa would say, quote, It was a big headache for us as the devs, and we passed the confusion on to the players. They didn't know how to play it. Yeah, the player response to this game was rough. The parry system and the combat in general just felt unrefined. But worst of all, the game was slow. As I've said many times now, the entire industry was moving to 3D graphics, so the 2D sprite-based games were trying to compete by making themselves faster and crazier. You had the alpha games that were full of fast-paced aggressive combat, 
The final version of Street Fighter 2 from a few years earlier was called Super Turbo for a reason. And then the Versus games were nothing but mind-blowing supers filling up the screen all at once as you swap in characters left and right. So going from those games to this, it felt like Street Fighter 3 just took a hit of NyQuil and they were laying down for a nap. But as harsh as the criticism was, the team behind Street Fighter 3 took all that in and they learned from it. And with a handful of more developers being added onto the team to support them, they immediately got to work on the update, which would be released the very same year to much better results. Street Fighter 3 Second Impact Giant Attack, typically just shortened to Second Impact, would be released in September of 1997, only seven months after the first game. And I'll get to why it's called Giant Attack in just a moment, but as for the name Second Impact, we'll take this with a grain of salt, but I've read multiple reports that Yoshiki Okamoto insisted on the name because he was a big fan of Neon Genesis Evangelion, which premiered in Japan just two years earlier. And in that series, there's a huge cataclysmic event called the Second Impact. Now, I can't find any interviews with Okamoto saying this, so again, going to keep it filed under rumors for now. But what I can tell you is that Street Fighter 3's producer, Tomoshi Sadamoto, is the cousin of Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, Neon Genesis Evangelion's character designer. So you know what? There might be something to this rumor. Now, for this game, Capcom needed to address the many problems of the first game, and the big one was the combat. The main thing that was meant to make Street Fighter 3 unique was the parry mechanic. But the parry mechanic... kinda sucked. However, for Second Impact, several members of the old staff were now gone, and Hidetoshi Ishizawa, who previously had just been brought on towards the end of the first game's development to help out, was now promoted to being one of the new main planners on the game. And he realized parrying didn't feel very good. So while the other planners were focusing on rebalancing the combat, he focused specifically on the parrying, and he came to a realization that parrying was being used as a defensive mechanic just to negate chip damage. But what if instead it was used to create an opening to attack? In the first game, yes, you could parry and then respond with an attack, but the parry didn't create that opening. That wasn't really part of its design. It was more of that you could just find an opening if their attack was negated. It was essentially no different than blocking and punishing. So he wanted the parry to now be designed specifically around countering. He talked about other moves that are designed to counter, and how often they will cause the character to go into a stance or a pose, and that will tell your opponent, don't attack now, I'm about to counter you, do not come in and hit me right now. But with a parry, characters could launch right into that as a response to your opponent attacking, meaning you never knew when it was coming, vastly increasing the tension of each match. And now that Ichizawa realized what they needed to do with the parry mechanic, the game suddenly felt completely different. Parrying was no longer just this thing that had a big risk for very little reward. It was now a big risk for an equally big reward. In the last game, if you were going to counter off a parry, it would only really work on certain attacks and you would have to respond with something quick, like a light attack. But now, you could parry any move and you would have a big enough opening to counter with a heavy attack or with a special. You could even parry an attack that hit multiple times and then counter in between the different hits of that attack. The parry mechanic was now the star of the game and Capcom knew it. When you play through the arcade mode, you'll notice the opponents parrying far more often because yeah, that's the name of the game now. And when you get halfway through the arcade ladder, you'll once again be treated to a bonus game, just like in the old Street Fighters, but this bonus game would be centered all around parrying, because Second Impact wants you to know, this is what you have to learn. This is what the game is about. However, while Ishizawa was improving the parry, the rest of the team was tinkering on the combat. 
And while it's not immensely better, there is definitely an improvement. Attacks do feel smoother, and every character got brand new moves that were designed to help answer specific situations. For example, Alex is a grappler. Grapplers want to get in close, so he now has a charging hand slap that sends him all the way across the screen, perfect for closing that distance. Even Gil got some new moves, most notably a super where he calls down a storm of meteors, which I know is supposed to be intimidating, but if he uses this, it means he depletes his super bar, which means he can't resurrect, making this probably the only time I have ever been hoping for a boss to pull out their super move. I will take blocking a storm of meteors over you getting an entire free health bar any day. But the biggest addition to the gameplay came from the EX moves. These were supercharged versions of your normal specials that used up a portion of your super meter, but in return, they would either be stronger or faster, or they could have some kind of an additional property, like causing a wall bounce that would set up for further combos. EX moves were a premise that existed in other fighting games before this, such as Darkstalkers, which again, a handful of these developers had previously worked on those titles, so maybe they were responsible for bringing this mechanic over to Street Fighter, but they would end up being so popular and they provided so much variety to the gameplay that this would become a mechanic that would appear in every future game in this series. But there's more to combat in fighting games than just what specials they give you. How does the game actually feel? How do you move? That is incredibly important. That's the glue that holds those mechanics together. And that was one of the biggest problems in the last game. It just felt so clunky, it felt so slow. But second impact? Oh my god, this doesn't even feel like the same game. Nobody ever compliments second impact's gameplay because, spoiler alert for what's coming up, everybody only talks about the improvements made to the third installment. But when recording footage for this retrospective, going from new generation to second impact was like taking weighted clothing off. The characters are so much faster, so much more agile. It feels like you have so much more that you can combo together. And there's a much higher importance placed on juggles, which means placing even more importance on reading your hits and being ready for when to follow it up. Recording footage for New Generation was rough. I just wanted to be done with it. But for Second Impact, I had enough footage. I had everything I needed but I decided to keep playing for a few extra hours because I just wanted to see how much better everyone was. And they had several additions to this roster. Realizing they needed more classic Street Fighter characters, they decided to throw Akuma into the mix. He's not really here for any story reasons, Akuma's just being Akuma. But hey, people love Akuma. He doesn't need a reason to be in this game. Does he still do the Raging Demon? Not out. Yep, there you go, that's all I need to see. Then Yang was no longer an alternate skin for Yoon, he was now his own character. He still shared several attacks with his brother, but he did have several hand slices and other moves that helped him to stand out. Also, very small detail, but something that I really do enjoy, each of the old characters kept the exact same arcade endings from the last game, but in the previous game, if you beat the game with Yoon or Yang, then they shared the exact same ending, but their positions would be swapped in the artwork. But now, in Yang's ending, Hoimei, the girl who had a crush on Yoon, has been replaced with her sister, Xiaomei, a shy girl who has a crush on Yang. It is a very small detail, but it's a nice touch that helps to flesh these characters out and creates more personality between Yoon and Yang. But as for the completely new characters, in a bit of a shocking turn, they decide to look back. Not to Street Fighter, but once again, to Final Fight. From Germany, we got Hugo, a huge grappler who is kind of said to be a rival to Alex, and because his appearance is based on Andre the Giant, he is indeed the titular giant in Giant Attack. Although it is worth noting, Hugo was not originally intended to be in this game. He was supposed to be in the first game, but they couldn't get him finished in time, so in his place, they decided to create Sean. Which sounds really odd to me that they had already started work on Hugo, then when they realized they wouldn't be able to finish him in time, they still had time to create a completely new character in his place, but when you look at Sean's animations in that first game are far simpler than what Hugo's animations would be in this game, so I guess they were just able to make him quicker than they could finish Hugo. Hugo was a former member of the Mad Gear gang, but he quit to pursue his career in wrestling, being joined by his former gang member Poison as his manager. Poison would go on to be a bigger character for this series, so I'll wait until we get to the game where she actually joins to talk about her, but let's just say she would become a huge fan favorite as well. Back to Hugo though, he leans heavily into his wrestler role with a moveset that includes powerful air grabs, belly flops, and charging lariats that do major damage. And the last new character, but certainly not the least, was Yurian. 
He's Gil's brother, both of them being born into this secret society mean both of them were contenders to lead the Illuminati. However, after Gil was chosen for the role, Urien didn't take it very well. Because while Gil wanted to lead this organization because he believed it's his destiny and he is chosen to lead people into a promised land, Urien just wanted all that power and glory that came with leadership. He's arrogant, egotistical, megalomaniacal, and most importantly, always pissed off. Then again, if I grew up with a brother who everyone kept referring to as the Chosen One and treated like the second coming of Fabio Jesus, I'd probably have a chip on my shoulder too. As for his playstyle, he's a charge character who's got a little bit of everything. He can shoot out electric projectiles, or he can go full linebacker and just start shoulder tackling you from across the screen. But easily the most important move in his repertoire is the Aegis Reflector, a super where he tosses out a big wall of electricity that can be used to limit where your opponent can move on the screen, mix the opponent up, extend juggles. The amount of things that really talented players can do with the Aegis Reflector is insane. It is one of THE supers for Street Fighter 3. As for the presentation of the game, there were a couple of additions that were worth pointing out. All the new characters got their own stages, as did some of the older characters, meaning that Ryu and Ken no longer had to split the hot spring stage. Also, when you go into the final battle, you and the boss get a little dialogue exchange, but surprisingly enough, Gil wasn't the final boss for everyone. Some characters got unique final battles. Ken and Ryu fight each other, Sean fights Ken, Yun and Yang fight each other, Hugo fights Necro and convinces him to join him as his tag team partner. Evie doesn't seem too happy about that though. I said this when talking about the alpha games, but I love the idea of arcade endings having different bosses for everyone. It gives them more personality, and considering that some of the people that worked on Alpha 2 helped out with this game, this might have been one of their contributions. And one last little detail that I want to point out, Gil would never be playable in any of the arcade versions of Street Fighter 3. However, he would be playable on the home console version of Second Impact the home console version that only came out on the Dreamcast, meaning a lot of people never even knew about this. But let's not worry about that home console version right now, let's talk about the arcade release. Capcom wanted this game to keep the head versus head nature of the arcade scene alive, and after the previous version failed to do that, how did this one fare? Actually, much better! According to Game Machine Magazine, Second Impact would go on to be the third most successful arcade game of the year. Wow, it's almost like the roster alone wasn't the main reason for the first game's failure and doing something like actually making the game fun to play and actually telling people this was a Street Fighter game fixed a lot of the problems. In fact, speaking personally, I can guarantee you that business on this game was way better than on the first one because I have never seen an original Street Fighter 3 cabinet in my life. All the old arcades I used to visit when I was a kid never once got one of these. However, they did get a handful of second impact machines. This one actually did start to catch on. However, it was running behind a lot of its competitors and it still couldn't be sold on home consoles. And the gameplay, while much better, still wasn't where it needed to be. But above all else, the game still needed to find its identity. Yes, yeah, so looking at the gameplay, the parry mechanic was now coming into shape. People could now identify what made this game unique in terms of its raw ingredients. But what was the flavor of it? Well, two years later, Capcom finally found that answer. Street Fighter 3 Street Fighter 3 3rd Strike would be released in arcades in May of 1999, giving the developers a year and a half between it and Second Impact, and they got to work on it immediately. Just like how when the first Street Fighter 3 came out, Capcom knew that a second version was on the way, when Second Impact was released, they knew right away that they were going to be working on a third version. A fact that Hidetoshi Ishizawa accidentally announced to the press as Second Impact was coming out. Something he now realizes was probably a mistake. But Capcom didn't punish him for this, instead they promote him to being the lead designer for the game. Yeah, Ishizawa went from being brought on at the end of the first game's development where he learned that nobody knew what they were doing, then he fixed the parry mechanic in the second game, and now for the third game he was running everything. 
and he quickly learned that this was going to be a very heavy role because after talking to the game's programmers, he learned that there was a major problem with the character's data. He spoke about this in that 15th anniversary interview, however, he didn't go into many details about what exactly the problem was, but in response to these issues, he had to get approval from Capcom's higher-ups to completely change the game around from the bottom up. But he did get approval for this, and he and his team spent the next year basically reworking the entire system. These changes heavily impacted the gameplay of Third Strike, but before we get to that, let's talk about some of the other ways that Third Strike was different. As I mentioned earlier, Street Fighter 3 was struggling to find an identity. What was the thing that made it stand out compared to other fighting games? I mean, at this time you had Darkstalkers, which was all about monsters, Rival Schools, which focused on students and teachers, Samurai Showdown focused on figures from Feudal Japan, Mortal Kombat had its gore. Pretty much every fighting game had something that helped it to stand out. Well, with Third Strike, Street Fighter finally found that new sound they've been looking for. Here's the character select screen from Second Impact. And here's the character select screen from Third Strike. Welcome to the world of Street Fighter 3. Prepare for battle. Choose and pick the best one. Five, four, three, two, one. Capcom reached out to Canadian rapper Infinite to give Third Strike a hip hop tone, and this is exactly what the sound of this game needed. It was catchy, it was cool, and it matched the younger cast of this game. It actually captured the tone of a new generation. And this change in direction was largely thanks to the game's new sound director, Yoshinori Ono, who reportedly encouraged Capcom to move the game's music in this direction. And he was right. This new hip-hop tone was great for Third Strike. But so was the rest of the music. So many of these stages have tracks that just scream future classics. The jazzy score of the New York stage, the poppy almost electronic sound in the China stage, and the moment you land on Elena's stage, you will never be able to get these beats, these beats, these beats out of your head. Ono did a great job with this game's sound. Boy, I wonder if him being involved in this game would lead to anything for him in the future that would somehow end up impacting the entire course of this industry. Who can say? But beyond just the music in this game, so many other little sounds just got you hyped. The announcer now has this smooth attitude to him that doesn't sound like any other fine game announcer in the 90s. You hear this guy tell you, Alright, that's cool. And you can't help but think, yeah. Yeah, alright, that was cool. And when your super meter filled up in second impact, here's what it sounded like. In third strike, when your meter filled up, this is what you heard. And that just gets you pumped. Hearing, let's go, makes it feel like it's time to do something cool now. And you want to know a crazy story about that sound effect? Capcom didn't record that on their own. They sampled it from a source. That source? To the Batmobile. Let's go. Yes, I'm not kidding you. Adam West is in a Street Fighter game. So you got Batman and you got Mr. T both being in Street Fighter games within two years of each other. And I would also be willing to take a guess that this involvement would probably have come as a shock to both of them. In fact, there's tons of popular sound effects and beats from other songs that are sampled for the tracks in Third Strike. I'd recommend checking out this video by David Sinclair, who broke down where all the different samples in Third Strike came from. It's actually really informative. There's a lot in here that I was completely unaware of. Did you know Pac-Man is in here somewhere? Yeah, it's true. Check out the video. And visually, the game also saw a bump in quality. The stages are some of the best of the arcade era, and certain characters before a match begins will have unique intros with each other, something that was very rare for games at this time, but they always got you so excited whenever you found a new one. And these character animations were touched up to look even better, and that is nowhere more obvious than the brand new characters. The new additions to this game, whether you love them or hate them, are arguably the best looking characters in this game. These animations were pushing what sprites were capable of at this point in time. These new characters include Twelve, an android created by Guild Secret Society that's capable of morphing its body around, and the animators went off on this. He has got some of the most fluid sprite art of any character from this generation. He also speaks entirely in binary, and apparently it actually does translate to real win quotes. Then from France, there's Remy. Remy's father abandoned his family as a kid so he could pursue the path of a fighter, and as a result, Remy's sister died and Remy went all Mr. Freeze on her and encased her in a block of ice. I have no idea how he did that. 
Because of this, Remy holds a grudge against fighters, making him super angsty, but not to the point of being a villain. He's more neutral. As for how he fights, Remy is a charged fighter who... Listen, he's just Guile. He's got his own version of Sonic Boom, he's got his own non-union French equivalent version of the Flash Kick, he's Guile. And that was entirely on purpose. Funamizu said that Remy was created to fit a moveset that they felt was missing from Street Fighter 3. Translation, Guile and Charlie fans were mad that their mains weren't in here, so they were trying to make them happy. In fact, I remember back in the day, there was a rumor that everyone was sharing that Remy's dad was actually Charlie, and he didn't abandon his family, but he was killed by Bison and Remy just never knew the truth. That is in no way true at all, but I have definitely spoken to a couple of people over the years who also had that exact same rumor going around their arcades. Then speaking of older characters people want in this game, Chun-Li finally returned due to popular demand from outside and inside of Capcom. Okamoto, who you'll remember from earlier, had demanded that Ryu got put back in here so that more of the old cast could return, kept hammering away at the developers to add Chun-Li. Funamizu said that Okamoto was insistent on her return and considered her to be the face of Capcom. I would like to remind you all right now that when Street Fighter 2 was in development, Okamoto tried to give her a smaller health bar to make her weaker than the rest of the cast, and now just a few years later he was walking around the office in a number one Chun-Li fan t-shirt and asking everybody why there isn't more Chun-Li. But Funamizu also said that the number one complaint that he heard from fans about Street Fighter 3 was where was Chun-Li. So they finally decided to not only add her in, but also make her OP as hell. Listen, I don't normally talk about tier lists because everybody has different opinions about who's top tier and who's bottom tier. Everyone thinks Chun-Li is top tier in this game. As for her story, Chun-Li gets pulled back into the field one more time when a group of children, including some of her own students, are kidnapped by Gil's secret society for experiments and other nefarious purposes. Now going from one of the more standard Street Fighter characters to one of the weirder, I present you with Q. Who is Q? What is Q? Who knows? He's a giant slow moving man in a trench coat and a metallic mask. Or maybe he's actually a robot, nobody really knows. He is completely shrouded in mystery. He doesn't even talk, he just breathes like Darth Vader and punches like a truck. All we know about him is that he's been spied all over the world, spying on people for his own questionable purposes. In fact, there's even a rumor in the Street Fighter fanbase that Q first appeared in the original Street Fighter 2 because people believe that he looks a lot like this one guy standing in the background of Ken's stage. And lastly is Makoto. She's a spunky tomboy who is very serious and is always looking to prove herself. Her father's dojo needs new students, so she figures if she enters this tournament it will drum up business. At first glance, Makoto might seem kind of basic to the average player. She doesn't have any crazy fireballs, she doesn't put out a wall of electricity, her fists don't catch on fire. No, she just punches and kicks you. But she does it really, really well. Makoto isn't a punch girl, Makoto is THE punch girl. In many ways, Makoto sums up what's so great about Third Strike because she has several moves at her disposal that are great for so many situations. She can rush you down, she can mix you up, she can grab and stun you, and if you put all that in the hands of someone who really knows what they're doing, she can pressure an opponent into oblivion. Makoto has become one of the most popular characters in this entire franchise. Remember that popularity poll I mentioned way back when we were talking about Sakura? I said that Sakura came in number one, Makoto came in number two. And considering Makoto has been in far fewer games than Sakura, that's impressive. And it's not like this is some modern development either where people now just suddenly start liking her. People loved her from the start. When Capcom did location tests for Third Strike in both Japan and America, they asked players who their favorite characters were, and Makoto came in number one in both regions. Also, I have no idea why Akuma has a lion face in the American section. I don't even know where to begin guessing on that one. But as good as the music was, as memorable as the new characters were, as impressive as the graphics were, that is not the reason why everyone loves Third Strike as much as they do. Because when it comes to the combat of this game, you know what they say, the Third Strike is what counts. You know if you are unfamiliar with Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, to put it simply, it has been described by many diehard fighting game fans as one of, if not THE best fighting game ever. This game is spoken of so highly within the FGC that I'll just say it right now. If you ever get asked by a big fighting game fan, what's the best fighting game of all time? If you want to impress them, just say Third Strike. 
Even if they don't agree with you, they'll at least think you know what you're talking about. Picking a single game to yeah, represent- Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, 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 oh! Okay, I take it all back. This list is goaded. Oh, third strike. I gotta say, I love this guy. List suddenly became based as f If I were to go before the fighting game High Council, and I said Project Justice is the best fighting game of all time, I would have to stand up there and filibuster that decision like Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. But if I said Third Strike was the best game of all time, they'd probably give me a high five and there would be no follow-up questions. And while I'll admit, I don't think there is any such thing as a best fighting game of all time, yeah, I get it. I totally understand the overwhelming positives around this game, and I see how far ahead of the time it was. But what makes Third Strike so good isn't any specific mechanic. It's not one thing that you can point at and go, oh, well, the parry mechanic, that's why it's so good. It's because of the parry. Lots of games have parries. That alone isn't why this game is so beloved. Now, what makes Third Strike so good is something that is very hard to put into words. Don't get me wrong, the parry was still just as good, if not better than it was in the last game, and the maneuverability still felt great. And there were several new features, like for example, now instead of doing a throw by pressing forward and heavy punch or kick, like you have in all the previous Street Fighters, now you would press light punch and light kick together, which was immensely better. This opened up more possibilities of what you could do with your heavy punch and kick when you're close to the opponent. And this would end up becoming how throws would be performed in this series from this point forward. However, while all that stuff is good, I'd say that none of them specifically make this such a good game. I would say that comes down to the fact that the balance adjustments and new moves make it so the stuff you can do with characters in this game is insane. In fact, I'll go ahead and apologize right now. I always like to use my own footage in these retrospectives, so I am very sorry for the really, really low quality Third Strike gameplay you're watching right now. Here. Here, this is what actual good third strike footage looks like. Game. Yeah, and I like the way he's using the back dash, just getting spaces correctly, getting the max distance on those pokes. But then he gets towards the agent. Oh, what an escape, though. Oh, look at that. Carries him, gets the back forward. Out of there, or so we think. Oh, no. Goes for the EX. Yep, that's fine. Yeah. Very, very difficult to parry. I mean, it's like playing Monopoly, and you don't go to jail after rolling three doubles. Oh, huge launcher. This is going to be a big combo. Yeah, and he's going to keep it juggling because this is Vegas, baby. He's handling the props better than Carrot Top. There, that's what this game looks like when played by somebody who knows what they're doing. To put it simply, the adjustments made to this game raise the ceiling to incredible levels, making this one of those impossible to master games. People have been playing this game for over 20 years now, and they're still learning new tech. Characters like Yoon have so many possibilities to what they can do. Yurian is a pressure god. chun -Li and Ken aren't just better than they had ever been before. They are arguably better than they would ever be in any game after this. I will admit, though, the game is very, very unbalanced. There are some characters that might as well not even be in here. Necro, I love your whole vibe, man. No way are you ever going to compete. Sean, everyone loved you in the previous games, but they nerfed the hell out of you in this game. 12, your animation is top notch. Nobody ever picks you. However, every fighting game is unbalanced. It is impossible to make a game where everyone is equally good. Except for Street Fighter 1, Ken and Ryu are perfectly balanced in that game. And it feels horrible. The important thing with fighting games isn't making it so that every character is balanced, it's making it that every character is fun. And that's the crazy thing about Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. No matter how bad some characters are, they still feel pretty fun to play. You could go through this entire lineup and still have a good time. However, that does lead me to the one... I don't want to say problem with the game, it's not a problem. It's more of just a warning that I feel this game comes with. Third Strike has incredibly high ceilings, but it's got equally high floors. Street Fighter 2 and the Alpha series are games where you can go into them not really knowing anything and still find some impressive stuff to do. You can just pick those games up, press some buttons, and have a good time. But you pick Third Strike and you quickly realize, oh, this was not made for the button bashers. 
This was made for the lab monsters. This game was made for the people that wanted to go into the training room and keep tinkering and experimenting to find every little thing these characters can do. Don't get me wrong, there are a few characters in here who are accessible to new players, but a good chunk of this roster, you'll need some time with them. But I feel like that was by design. Remember that interview with Funamizu where he said that he wants Street Fighter 3 to quote, convey our hope that the tradition of live arcade matches will continue for a long time to come. That's what Third Strike is. And it's another reason why so many people consider it to be the best fighting game of all time. This is a game that was designed for that competitive audience. Because it's a game that becomes a completely new experience when you're playing another person. And sure, that's true for every fighting game. Playing against someone will always be different than playing against the computer. However, Street Fighter 3 is built specifically around that experience. I mentioned that balance isn't always the most important thing in a fighting game. It's more important to have a character that feels fun. But there's three other things that really define a great fighting game. Expression, decisions, and answers. And these are three qualities that Third Strike excelled at. Thanks to all the moves and abilities that characters had, thanks to the parry mechanic, thanks to the maneuverability, it meant that every character could be played in a way that reflected who was controlling them. You could have a game where two people pick Ken, and neither of them are going to play him in the same way. When you played against someone who picked Chun-Li, you weren't just playing against Chun-Li, you were playing against your opponent. You had to figure out not how Chun-Li played, you had to figure out how they played Chun-Li. Again, this expression is something that all games strive for, and today I think tons of games have captured that. But at this point in time, Third Strike achieved that better than almost any other game out there. And part of the way that this expression comes through is because of the speed of the game. Typically when you think of fast fighting games, you think of ones that have running, or air dashing, or double jumps, and Third Strike has none of that. But what it does have is fast decision making. The speed at which you can react to your opponent in this game is very high. And because you have so many ways of responding to attacks, it means you have to make decisions quick. And that's what Third Strike is at its core. Third Strike is a battle of decisions. You can watch someone's life bar melt, not because of one massive long combo, but because of a string of correct decisions being made one after another. And those decisions lead into my final important point. Answers. In a fighting game, when your opponent comes at you with an attack, you want your character to have an answer to it. You want your character to be able to respond to pretty much any situation they could find themselves in. But that is a very hard thing to achieve in a game. But because of the maneuverability, the range of moves, the parry mechanic, and how fast you can make decisions, most characters had an answer to whatever your opponent threw out. And you combine that with the amount of expression that players could put into how they fought? It meant that when you played against someone, you weren't finding answers to their character, you were finding answers to them. This became a game that excelled at forcing you to read your opponent, to not just knowing what moves you could punish, but to making decisions that could counter their decisions. And along those same lines, answers work in two ways. It isn't just about finding an answer to your opponent, it's also about having an answer to your own character. It's about finding the optimal way to play your character. And that's another reason why Third Strike is so important to so many people. There really isn't a way to play your character. There isn't an answer to how should I play Ken, how should I play Chun-Li, how should I play Alex. You can kind of play them in whatever way you feel the most comfortable with. It goes back to giving your character expressions. You have answers on how to play them, but that doesn't mean it's the answer. Everyone is going to have their own. Again, there are other games out there that I can say that about, but in 1999, that was pretty rare. And I'd even be willing to say that many of the titles out there that have accomplished this level of expression, they're titles that were probably either inspired by Third Strike or by another title that was inspired by Third Strike. And because of all of this, Third Strike is one of the most important fighting games in history, especially for competitive fighters. To this day, Third Strike tournaments still get massive attention and are full of longtime competitors still honing their craft, being joined side by side with brand new challengers who are brewing up their own flavor of gameplay. But speaking of the competitive scene and why this game is so important to the history of fighting games, there is one moment in time that you cannot ignore 
when talking about Third Strike. A moment that in some ways would define what competitive fighting games would become. August 1st, 2004, California State Polytech University. This was the final day of EVO 2004, the biggest fighting game tournament in America. The finals of the loser's bracket of the Street Fighter Third Strike tournament had just begun and it had come down to Justin Wong, a master of defensive footsies and one of the best players in North America, going up against the master of oppressive play, Daigo Umihara, one of the best players in Japan. Now, at this point in time, the online fine game scene was not what it is today. There were no combo videos, there was no frame data breakdowns, nobody was uploading their matches onto YouTube, and there were no big famous fighting game streamers. If you wanted to watch pros playing fighting games, you would either have to buy a DVD of it, or you would have to find really fuzzy footage of it upload onto a message board and try and figure out what was happening. But even just the little bits of footage that was being uploaded onto the internet back then was enough to make diehard Third Strike players wonder who would win between these two titans. Their playstyles were so different. Which one of them would come out on top? The immovable object or the unstoppable force? Well here, at EVO 2004, this was about to be decided, as both players had won one round. Justin took an early lead, getting Ken's health so low that Daigo was being forced to move in to try and even the score, but Justin had answers to each of his actions, until finally, Daigo was left with no health. All he had was the invisible magic pixel, meaning one hit would KO him, not even a hit that had to connect. Chip damage at this point would be enough to win just in the game, meaning even if Daigo blocked, it would all be over. And so Justin launched out with Chun-Li's super, a flurry of kicks that didn't hit once, it didn't hit twice, it hit 15 times. It was truly over for Daigo. And that's when the greatest moment in fighting game history happened. Rare footage of Daigo actually angry. Justin's turtle style overcome Rao. Now on the verge of putting Daigo down. One nothing. Daigo did the impossible, and I mean that quite literally. Chun-Li's super was actually thought to be impossible to parry at this point. And yet Daigo, with more tension on his shoulders than any of us can even comprehend, managed to do it. 15 perfect parries in a row, and then he counterattacked at the exact right moment, turning Wong's offense into an opening, proceeding to win the match. The entire crowd's mind was blown. People couldn't stop talking about this. This became such a big moment, nobody even remembers the rest of the match. Yeah, remember, this was the losers' finals. So after this, Daigo ended up going on to the grand finals where he lost. And nobody talks about that because who cares about that moment? This was what everything was about at this moment. But Daigo's incredible series of parries wasn't just a hype fighting game moment. It would go so far beyond that. Because over the next few days, blurry footage of this event would get put up onto fighting game forums, slowly spreading across the globe. And then the next year, EVO would release a DVD with some of the best moments from the previous year's show. And it included this moment, which they labeled as EVO Moment 37. And from here, Evo Moment 37, also known as the Daigo Parry, would leave an impact on the fighting game community that is still being felt to this day. Because you see, at the risk of sounding really pompous, getting better at fighting games is a long journey. It's a climb up a giant mountain. And competitive players like Justin Wong and Daigo Umihara, they knew what the peak looked like. But remember, this was back before you had 5,000 combo videos being uploaded onto YouTube every single day. Most people didn't know what good fighting game gameplay actually looked like. Most people thought the extent of what fighting games were capable of was just what they had seen playing with their friends or at the arcade. I mean, 
You've all met that one person at some point who says they thought fighting games were just mashing buttons, and whoever wins is just whoever can mash buttons the most. They think that because they don't see gameplay like this. That's just how they and their friends play it, so they assume that's just all that is. And back then, a lot of people thought that. But when this clip started to spread like wildfire, it made so many people realize what actual high top tier gameplay looked like. It was the moment that everyone across the world actually got a glimpse of what the view was like at the top of that mountain. And it led so many people to start looking deeper into the fighting game community, to start looking at what exactly you could do with fighting games, to watch other high competitive players actually pull off really amazing stuff like that. And it was the moment that so many people didn't just say, you can do that, but more importantly, it made them say, I kind of want to learn how to do that. This clip inspired so many people to not just play fighting games, but to push themselves to become better, to try and climb that mountain for themselves, to see what else they were truly capable of. I honestly believe that when it comes to the world of competitive fighting games, you can draw a very clear line before and after EVO Moment 37. That in many ways is comparable to how Street Fighter 2 changed the world of fighting games over 10 years before this. Unfortunately, that's the impact that Third Strike made on fighting games in the future. In 1999 when it was released, yeah, it was kind of rocky. Well, okay, it was positively received. It was applied in reviews left, right, and center. But in 1997 when New Generation came out, the arcade scene was starting to cool off. In 1999 when Third Strike was released, yeah, it was frozen. At this point, if you were a fighting game and you wanted to survive, you needed home console sales. And as I have pointed out multiple times, Street Fighter 3 couldn't run on a home console. Except of course the Dreamcast, which Third Strike did get a release on the very next year, but again, if you're putting your hopes on the Dreamcast, you're putting your hopes on a lifeboat with a leak in it. To give you an idea of how poorly it did, Third Strike on the Dreamcast sold around 100,000 copies. That same year, Tekken Tag Tournament came out, and it sold two and a half million copies. Third Strike would get a PS2 release in Japan, and as part of the Anniversary Collection, which released worldwide, both coming out in 2004, the same year as EVO Moment 37, meaning that's a great moment to get some synergy going, to get people to go out and pick these games up, right? Well, while I'm sure the competitive players were jumping at this, you have to remember, the casual fighting game fanbase is always going to be about 10 times larger than the competitive fanbase. And at this time, not only was the casual fighting game audience at a low point, but that casual fighting game audience didn't want 2D sprite-based games. As I have pointed out many times already, 3D games were kind of ruling the market at the time. And while critics did praise the game, giving it a lot of 8s and 9s across the board, many critics also pointed out that the game was, as I said earlier, Mostly for purists, it wasn't really a game for casual players. So the arcade scene was dying, and on the home market, the game wasn't selling well either. And neither were a lot of other Capcom fighting games. You've probably heard that the early 2000s were called the dark time for fighting games, and while that is a bit of a misleading title, when it comes to Capcom fighters and Street Fighter in particular, yeah, it was accurate. We went from getting brand new Street Fighter games, or an updated version of a game, every single year, sometimes even more than once a year, to not getting anything after this. The Dreamcast release of Third Strike and Street Fighter EX3 for the PlayStation 2 both came out in 2000. And that was it. The Street Fighter series, for the very first time since 1991, was now put on hold. For the first time ever, Capcom did not have plans for a new Street Fighter. But that didn't mean anything. That didn't mean things were over, right? I mean, this was Street Fighter. It was the game that created Capcom. This entire company owes its success to Ryu and Ken. There was no way that Capcom was just going to drop one of their most important franchises. That would be like them just getting rid of Mega Man. Right, Mega Man? <laughs> oh, that's not a good sign. Yeah, Capcom put all of their money into the arcades, and when they realized they couldn't just will the arcade scene back to life, they started leaning into home consoles, and leaning into them hard. And hey, tons of amazing franchises came from this decision. But almost as if they now had a spite towards their old arcade titles, pretty much all of them were getting scrapped. Capcom did keep supporting their fine games for a few more years with the Versus Marvel and SNK games, 
But you can't put all your hopes for new fighting games on crossovers, because that requires you to rely on a partner. And eventually, that partner is going to decide to split. It's like building your house on top of sand. The foundation isn't very secure. Then Capcom did make a big push for brand new fighting games like Project Justice, Power Stone, Tech Romancer, and Plasma Sword, making a really strong push to breathe brand new life into their lesser known or brand new franchises. But every single one of those titles I just listed off were Dreamcast exclusives, because I guess Capcom just really loved betting all their money on the losing horse. If they had put any of those games out on the PS2, we would be living in a very different, much better world at this point. So Capcom made one final push for their fighting games with Capcom Fighting Evolution, or as I like to call it, the final nail in the Capcom fighter's coffin. I already brought this up in the last video and we did a whole retrospective just on this one title, but to summarize, Capcom spent a ton of time and money on a 3D fighter that would bring many of their franchises together. However, the game wasn't any fun, so they decided to scrap it, and with the tiny sliver of a budget they had left, they just threw a bunch of sprites that they had from other games together into one big Mugen, and everyone hated it. This was Capcom's big hope for the future of their fighting games, and it reviewed miserably and sold even worse. And to pile on top of this already impressive stack of problems, certain employees at Capcom at this time were rising in the ranks. And these employees were starting to whisper in the higher-ups ears, yeah, don't worry about the Japanese market, appeal to the West. And fighting games and other arcade-style games were arguably more successful in Japan at this time, so even if there was a demand for fighting games, Capcom wasn't listening. And that was it. Street Fighter created a genre, a genre that ruled an entire decade. It defined the arcade scene in the 90s, and even after creating what we know fighting games to be, it kept innovating them time and again, creating some of the most memorable characters and moments in the history of video games. And now, it was done. The games weren't selling anymore, and nobody at Capcom really wanted to support them. There were no continues left, and we were all out of quarters. The timer was counting down, and there was nothing we could do. For Street Fighter, one of the most beloved and important video game series of all time, this truly was... Game Over. WAKE UP! Thank you all very much for tuning in again to another episode of the Street Fighter Retrospective. And if you want to follow up on that cliffhanger ending, make sure that you click that subscribe button and ring that bell so you know when the next episode goes live. Although I am going to let you guys know right now, the next episode is going to be a little bit of a detour. I've been promising you guys that we were going to talk about something for a while now, and I think the next episode is the perfect time for it, so... If you want to see the history of one of the weirdest spinoffs for Street Fighter, make sure you come back then. Also, I just want to go ahead and thank a couple people right now. I want to thank the artists who would provide artwork for these retrospectives. You can always find their contact information in the description down below. I appreciate these guys so much for coming in here and making such great thumbnails for these videos. Also, I want to thank our patrons whose names are going up across the screen right now. This is a brand new thing that we're going to start doing where at the end of all these retrospectives, I'm going to list off our patrons just as a way to say thank you, to say that I appreciate all of you guys for helping to donate to support this channel. And if you would like to join our Patreon and get sneak peeks at things that we have planned coming down the road or even vote on upcoming videos, then you can follow the link in the description down below. Also, while you're in that description, make sure that you check out all my other socials. I'm on pretty much everything at this point. I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on Threads, I'm on Tumblr, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. Not on X, though. Never on X. No one is on X. That is not a thing. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and come back next time.